Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of News by Muse. As always, I am your host, Manny Gomez. As we wrap up 2023, it's a fun time to look back at the great year Latinos have had in television and in movies. In TV, for example, we have the final season of Mayans MC. We also had the second season of Lopez vs. Lopez and the hilarious second season of This Fool. And in films, we had a first feature Latino superhero with Jaime Reyes and Blue Beetle, as well as other great films like Flaming Hot, as well as A Million Miles Away. To talk more on the subject, recently I caught up with Diana Luna. She's the executive director of the National Association of Latino Independent Producers. They look to change media culture by advocating and promoting the professional needs of Latinos of artists in media. This conversation ahead of their end of the year celebration, which we were excited to attend, and you'll get to look at it in just a minute. But first, here's what Diana Luna had to say about where we're headed. Storytelling. Is it coming universal and when we we have those stories yeah permitted of all that our latino nuances culturally etc like everything but it's a story that appeals to everyone so i think that what makes me really hopeful is that these projects already set the precedent into what can come next and from there elevating uh, our communities so that, again, we can replicate what happened in the music industry and, I mean, being the next cool thing in town. But I think that the more that we point out and remind all this, um, uh, this industry that there is a big market that is consuming constantly, um, then they have to, to make a move. You know, it's, it should be part of their strategy for growth. How do we devote these big budgets to movies that are going to have the audience needed because Latinos are the thing right now? Hi, I'm Brittany DeLeon, and I'm here at the Nalipo Award celebrating Latinos in excellence. I'm excited because, you know, I think what I'm noticing, and I'm going to say it, there's something changing that everyone's really looking out for each other. Everyone's trying to collaborate a little bit more. Everyone's um, working together and cheering each other on. So there's more cheerleading, more collaboration, more cooperation, um, and more than I've ever seen before because we were always fighting over a tiny little sliver of the uh, of, of pie. And now we're seeing enough opportunities, enough opportunities for us to create our own avenues that everyone is really celebrating each other more than I've ever seen. So it's exciting. My favorite moment in 2023, was probably having my quinceanera come to tr come to life on Dancing with the Stars. That was probably the highlight of, dance of my just month in my year. What is something that inspires you to continue to you know be in this industry? Everyone, everyone. Honestly, it comes to like within the fans, and then of course you know other people that I work with. It makes me very excited and makes me motivated to continue because. They make me excited and they make me proud and they make me want to keep doing it, you know? You are here at Nalip. How important are these events for our culture? I mean, I think it's, it's important that we come together and, and celebrate our accomplishments. Um, I think there's been a lot of great work this year, um, you know, that shows that had predominantly Latino cast or, 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 or you know, the main characters were Latino or the or Latino storyline. So I feel like, like it's great that we come together and recognize that and, and celebrate it. Can I tell you, it was just the, how much the love of our show, Lopez vs. Lopez, has gotten. Yeah, I, we got, well luckily we were able to get a full season and the first 13 were really difficult for me because sometimes it was really close to home and I've never done it before but the community and the family and it's so wonderful. Also I got to be a judge on RuPaul's Drag Race so that, which is coming out in January so that was like, I'm so excited. 2023 has treated me very well. We need to make this united force bigger every time and I'm so proud to be invited to be part of it. I'm so proud that um, I, I produced uh, a movie called The Wind Walker with a Mexican director. Uh, I'm in the leading role in a lot of people and just to feel really honored to be, to, to, to be part of this film. My favorite moment was when I met Sir Patrick Stewart and our first scene had to be him shirtless on the table because he was dying. That's not a spoiler, everyone knows it because it came out last year. Um, and then as he's laying down shirtless um, in a very like awkward situation, he started asking me, where are you from? And I'm like, Argentina. And he starts telling me tales of when he was very, very young, like in his 20s doing theater in Argentina. 
Nobody knew, I had no idea, and there we are bonding on that table. It was amazing. We had a great time here at Nalip. Manny, back to you at the studio. Looks like they had a lot of fun at the event. You can catch the full red carpet interviews as well as my full conversation with Diana on our YouTube channel and our website, MuseTV.net. Now over to box office news as expected. The whimsical fantasy musical Wonka took the top spot at the box office with $39 million here in the States. The Timothy Charlemagne-led film opened last weekend in international markets, giving it a worldwide grand total of about $150 million. This fares well for the Warner Brothers film as the family-friendly film costs about $125 million to make. It will be interesting to see if it has staying power in theaters the next few weeks, as the studios will also have two other films coming out next week, another musical, The Color Purple, as well as the superhero film Aquaman and The Last Kingdom. Universal Pictures through Illumination will also be releasing an animated feature titled Migration. In second place, Science Gates The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes continues to stay in the top two spots since its release with an additional $6.1 million. Globally, it has made about $300 million to date. And in third place, the surprise number one from last week, Hayao Miyazaki's G-Kids film The Boy and the Heron with a little over $5 million showing that there is still much love for the famed director's animated films. Staying with Japanese films in the fourth spot is Toho's Godzilla Minus One, with just under $5 million bringing its U.S. total to about $30 million. The film was supposed to only be around in theaters for a week, but its unsuspected success has kept it around for more people to enjoy on the big screen. Catch it if you can. In fifth place and refusing to leave the top five is DreamWorks Trolls Band Together, with an additional $4 million. After five weeks at the box office, it has globally brought in about $183 million. Without a doubt, currently, Universal are at the top of the animated film mountain. Speaking of this week's top film, Wonka, I had the opportunity to chat with Bricia Lopez, an acclaimed chef from Southern California and partner at Huela Guetza, about the rich history of chocolate and Latin American culture, especially with its origins being linked to Mesoamerica. And... A key ingredient in one of our favorite foods, mole. What's been your experience in in introducing mole and introducing chocolate into some of these more savory profiles that people aren't necessarily associated with, but we are. I know that yeah. uh, we always have a lot of pride in our family with my dad, especially when he's making his mole, where he's making his red enchilada sauce and all of a sudden there's chocolate. And I remember some of the first times thinking like, what was he doing? But then of course, you know, growing up with it, it becomes normal. Well, and, you know, kind of like Wonka, what has that been to, um, for you, your restaurant, your locations, introducing people to that side of chocolate. Yeah, I, you know, it really is such a privilege. I think that in a, in a lot of ways, um, my family's restaurant is shaping the Oaxacan palate of LA. Uh, and I love that, you know, we've been, we've been around for a very, very long time and a couple of generations. And when I speak to young Oaxaqueños, I can't help but think, oh my gosh, we were responsible to make sure that you knew the best Oaxacan food. And I take my job very, very serious. I want to make sure that this generation, the next generation understands the power of food, that understands the power of their culture, and understands the power of learning what things are supposed to taste like. I think that's one of the things my dad taught me. You know, he said the best qual- the best thing you can have, the best skill you can have is understanding what great food is, because like, no one can lie to you about anything. And I think it's so true. And that really is what I like to do here at the restaurant and and I think, again, what this character in this movie is about. And I also love his spirit of the character in the movie, his spirit of just dreaming and knowing that anything could be possible, that all you need is a dream. And I think at the end of the day, that really is what an immigrant is, an immigrant dream is. You know, when you come into a new city and you know, trying to hustle, this is what he was trying to do and with food. And I think that really is the first place we go to as Latinos when we come into a, this country is what can I sell? Well, let's sell food because that's all I can do. <laughs> that's that's exactly what happened with my family. We had the Mexicali Rose in Alameda, California and in Oakland. And one of my first baby pictures when I was born is, is at a restaurant where my dad yeah. and his family worked. With both of us growing up in the restaurant industry, it made for a really, really fun conversation. A great indie film being released this week is titled The Mental State from director James Kamali, adapted from Josh Adele's acclaimed play. In this story, we find a high school senior from a rural Kentucky town struggling to cope with a severe mental health crisis and the effect on not only him, but his family and everyone around him. 
Carly, I, I'm just amazed at your performance as a parent. I empathize with the fact that I enjoyed the fact that despite what was happening, there's still always a glimmer of hope, despite how dark the situation was, that it could work out, that Andy could get better, you could be there for him. But you've been put as Angela in this, you know, circumstances where you've lost your husband. You know, you're you're trying to make it work with the, with another with another relationship all at the same time. Where where did you find Angela's voice and and just you know physically in, in what you were doing? Um, thank you so much, by the way, that means, that means a lot to me. And it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm, uh, blown away and very moved by the sentiment that as a parent, you felt something I am, I am not a parent at this point in time. And so it was, it was really crucial for me to try to get into the headspace of, uh, what would that be like if you have a child that you don't know how to help? I wanted to really make sure that Angela stayed active. I didn't want her to be wallowing or passive. There's a quote that Winston Churchill had that I kept kind of as like a sticky note uh, up that was, um, if you're going through hell, keep going. And I thought that that was kind of like the baddest, bossiest thing that I could imbue Angela with. And I, I wanted to keep her fighting in spite of what was going on around her you cannot spend any time on the ways in which you as the actor are different from your character you can only spend time on ways that you are the same my concern was being able to find why and like because everybody has reasons for doing things regardless if it's right or wrong or is helpful to them or not they have reasonings behind it. So that's what I had to do. I had to put myself in the shoes of this person and figure out how did, how did he end up getting to this place? And, you know, I, I was thinking in my head, like, okay, you know what, there's, there's going to have to be a lot of things that happen in here that get to that point. And that's what we wanted to make sure happened by the end of this was that by the end of the story, you weren't just you weren't really blaming anybody, but you were just seeing and empathizing with all these characters throughout. And I was just blessed to work with incredible actors like Jance and Carly and, and really everyone across the board. From Gravitas Ventures, you can catch The Mental State on all TVOD and digital platforms starting Tuesday. In streaming, we hope that you're enjoying season two of Reacher on Prime Video. We find Alan Ridson as Jack Reacher receiving a coded message that members of his former U.S. Army unit are being mysteriously murdered. Now, Reacher must reunite with three of his former teammates to investigate the case. I spoke with that team that included Maria Sten, Saren Swan, and Sean Sipos. A little bit about building that chemistry between you guys because you guys are all very, have very individual traits but really gel together very well and see how you guys work as a group. Well, we all secretly hate each other, so that was tough. We just don't get along at all. Um, Maria just kept bringing delicious food to set, which was super annoying. Yeah. Um, I mean, Sean would just try to, like, feed me with other things and give me good advice on life. That was really shitty, too. And then there was Alan, who just was, like, the worst number one. So overall, it was just a terrible, terrible experience. experience. If people could just stop being so nice and... And professional, yeah. I think maybe we could get somewhere, but at this point, you know, I think I think we're good. We, Alan yeah. was always trying to do the prankster thing and unscrew the um, wheels of the car when you like leave them loose. I know he was terrible though. There were things that he would try to do. to do. Yeah, it was terrible. No, we have a great time. We have a great great group of people. We've played poker together. There was some uh, check or uh, chess going on. They were say checkers. <laughs> so I was like, I don't, I don't remember any checkers, checkers. Okay. Nobody else played checkers. Sean and Alan were, we're a competitive bunch. We like yeah. to, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was playfully a uh, give each other a hard time. Yeah, I and mean, it, these people gamble with their lives and we just gambled with... In the winnie. Yeah, money. Uh, money, real money. money, which they still owe me. This but that's true. okay. Uh, I still feel oh. guilty about that. I know. I don't. I'm owed some money. <laughs> you can catch the first and second season of Reacher exclusively on Prime Video. Well, that's all the time we have for today, and also that's going to wrap it up for 2023. News by Muse, the weekly episode that I do, is going to be taking a vacation, a holiday break per se, uh, for Christmas and New Year's. We'll be back in the first week of January. I want to thank you guys so much 
for being with me on this crazy journey that started way back in September when I first came on to Muse TV and took this uh, little project over. Uh, hopefully 2024 it brings a whole lot more content uh, definitely is going to be a big year for me as i am getting married so uh, until then happy holidays to all of you as always yours truly i'm manny gomez with news by music